Somerset Maugham once wrote that the Orient allowed him to get down off his pedestal. But even Western travelers who lack a pedestal are confronted in the midst of Bangkok with a sense of their culture and morality being irrelevant. Bangkok means literally the city of angels, but if any still actually live here, they're not of a kind we in the West would ever recognize, and they do not carry Christian messages. Thai taxi drivers certainly don't rely on St. Christopher. They trust to providence, or to be more specific, the ancient principle of karma. Thailand is a vivid example of a non-Christian society which worships deities more various and, God knows, less jealous than our own. There is no celestial Mr. Big. The cross and the crescent have little place here. Buddha, however, is everywhere. Thailand is an intensely religious society, but it lacks a god head. The Buddha is honored with deep reverence at temples like Wat Po, but he is not and never will be a god. He created nothing except a new way of life and of seeing the world, setting an example that the pious Buddhist follows as the good Christian imitates Jesus. But his followers worship Buddha as the embodiment of a philosophy, not as the creator of mankind. Every time I see the reclining Buddha, I have this same extraordinary feeling that it's one of those rare images which is bigger than the thing that contains it. It was said of the Zeus's Olympia, which was built by Phidias, it was a sitting figure, that if it stood up, it would take the roof off. And with the reclining Buddha, you have the same feeling of something which is so large that if it were to move, the whole world would somehow be split open. It's not a divine figure, and yet it has a kind of generosity and humor which makes one realize the smallness of a human condition, particularly when you stand literally beneath its feet. Buddhism is a cult of the intellect, a philosophy, not a celebration or assertion of divinity. When he died, the Lord Buddha hoped not for divinity, but for nirvana, a state immune from desire. Buddha is actually a more practical example to man than any god can be. Jesus is, after all, inimitable. Even if Christians aspire to heaven, they can't hope to sit on the right hand of God. Buddha was merely an enlightened human being, something which, in theory at least, we can all be. I have an old friend in Bangkok called Paddy Dixon. He's a doctor who married a Thai and transplanted to Bangkok. I thought he might give me a primer in Buddhism for foreigners. After all, he was one himself once. Paddy, how long have you been in Thailand? Uh, 40 years, about. When I knew you at Cambridge, were you a Christian then? I was a nominal Christian, you know. I always went to church on Sundays because everybody else did. I was fed Christianity from a young age and I accepted it like a sponge. And rather more, I'd never really been happy about asking God for anything. Uh, give us this day our daily bread. I'd ne never been very, I always thought that people were always going to pray to God that this will happen or pray to God that that won't happen or pray for this and pray for that. And I thought, poor old God, really, all these people asking him for something all the time. It's n not on, it's rather so bad form. what have you become since then? Well, I think it's true to say that I have become Buddhist since then. Buddha never claimed to be God or yes. a God. Uh, all he uh, claimed was that he'd thought about life very much. And the big thing that he discovered, the real reason that people are unhappy in this world is because of desire. Desire for this, that, the other, whatever. That because of desire, and if only you could conquer desire, you would then be very happy. 
What about your future progress as a spirit or as a soul? Do, do, do you believe in that, or are you just happy to leave that to whatever happens to be the case? I'm a strong believer that this is just a phase, and that uh, when we die, uh, our soul will move on to the next phase. I personally think it's very likely that there may be some sort of circular thing about it, that we may come back again. I think that that is as likely as a lot of other things, that, uh, that I might float up onto a cloud and play a harp. Buddhists wait with patient anxiety for what will befall them in the next life. They may return as a nobler, luckier person or through having behaved badly as a dog or perhaps a pigeon. The concept of merit is the fuel and the lubricant of Buddhist reincarnation. To better yourself by meritorious acts is both a good thing and a kind of next life insurance. The merit is to be made by feeding the monks who early in the morning line up at once humble and demanding the handouts. The pious distribute largesse as widely and meritoriously as possible. There's no call to do good by stealth here. If you've got arms, flaunt them. Those who can't find time to prepare something at home can pick up a pre-packed offering. Are these buckets a form of cheating, really, on the part of people who give them to the monks? I mean, well, they're a bit of a shortcut, aren't they? I mean, if you're giving a gift, it's nice to select a gift and give it. This is a sort of ready-made uh, token gift. This is the Fortnum's and, hamper uh, for aesthetics, uh, is it? Well, the, the, this is a set of things all useful for the monks. Ovaltine seems a bit fancy for the, for the simple life, doesn't well, it? Well, they're, they're allowed to have a drink after midday, and nothing to eat after midday, but they can drink. And they do, I think, get hungry, and so they have a little Ovaltine or something. Monks are only human, after all. Ovaltine, and not Ambrosia, suits them fine. The lives of Thai people do have space for gods as well, but not exactly as we know them. We in the West tend to think of God as a singular mm -hmm. being mm -hmm. and therefore, rather fortunately, omnipotent and taking care of everything mm -hmm. himself, mm -hmm. a jealous God who does not like yes, other gods. Yes. Here, when Buddhism came to Thailand, animism was here already. Buddhism took in animism yes. within its own embrace, as long as it doesn't contradict with the major or the, the main concept of Buddhism we took in. All the gods, all the local gods, we took them in also. We talk about gods, small g and with s, plur plural. Like at this pavilion, I believe that there is God of this pavilion, a spirit that protects. I kind of spoke to him or to her, you know, asking for permission for me to, well, with the film crews, we'll be working here for some time, I hope you don't mind. That kind of speech, you know, I, I, I had with the spirit, with the gods, right. before we start the film. But do you really think that the spirit could do us any harm in this interview? Yes. 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 If suppose if I suppose if we come with you know being very rude, yes. you know start shouting and then you walk around. And, uh, the kind of thing that the spirit could do to us is that your camera wouldn't work. You know the script has gone wrong. You don't ask the right question. I don't answer the right question. That kind right. of thing. Right. You know it start raining all all of a sudden. <laughs> yes. <Right. laughs> You talked of the god of this pavilion. The god of this pavilion, I take it, will not also be at the hotel. In other words, they are very localized. Mm -hmm. Is this yes. like the gods which the animists build their spirit houses for? Yes, yes, same idea. You have to look after it to let the spirits above know that we're thinking about them. And we give them bits of food. I noticed. Which I think the birds probably benefit from mostly, but... Uh, we like to think the spirits had first go at them if they wanted to, you see. And we, uh, we hang uh, uh, these little garlands of flowers on the... Regularly or to, on special occasions or what? Uh, both. Right. Often if, you know, I think that something's going wrong, the roof's leaking or something like that, and I think, well, you know, it's rather a long time since I looked after the spirits. I'd better go and see how okay. they are. Yeah, we'll put it on the corner here. Are these gods, these spirits? No, spirits. No, no. They're just spirits. They're right? angels of lower levels. OK. Mm, yeah. Yes. Uh, they are rather irresponsible. So they're, really. they're like nymphs and things. In, nymphs in and it. shepherds come away. Right. Uh, what you might say. Uh, yes. yes. <laughs> 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 
Thailand means literally the land of the free. Unlike neighboring Burma and Cambodia, the Thais were never conquered by a foreign power, least of all a Western one. Thai Buddhism has not been invaded by Islam or compromised by Christianity. Yet Thailand has manifestly not escaped foreign influence. <laughs> Buddha himself emerged from the Indian Hindu tradition, which has a panoply of gods to rival the ancient Greeks. While Hindu gods are surplus to the strictly orthodox Buddhist requirements, they are not unwelcome in Bangkok. <laughs> The Greeks burned their animal sacrifices, believing that the smoke would rise to Mount Olympus, where the gods could inhale their refreshment. The Brahmins at this Hindu temple are vegetarians. They burn saris, not heifers, for a goddess who is at least as fashion conscious as her devotees. Fire is hungry and maybe divine, and is fed with spices as well as raiment for the delectation and appeasement of the gods. <laughs> Amongst the fast food eateries across town, a different tribute to another Hindu deity. downtown Bangkok, there's a sort of human jukebox, which is in fact a shrine to Brahma, the god who likes dancing girls. And so right opposite Planet Hollywood, which is the newest and most powerful mythology, one which sweeps the whole of the world, is one of the oldest mythologies. I suppose a version of temple prostitution, though a very decorous one in this case, in which you pay so much money in order to get these girls to dance with so much talent. Dances which once upon a time captivated the god and now entertain the devout people who come here for a sort of fast prayer bar, I suppose you could say. They seem to work with great speed. They buy whatever they need in the way of flowers or uh, joysticks, bang them in, quick prayer, and on they go. Even inside the royal Thai palace, the cloisters are filled with scenes from the Hindu mythology of the Ramayana, officially quite outside the Buddhist canon. Still, Western religious art is lavish with references to the Greco-Roman mythology, which Christianity claims to have rendered obsolete and even sacrilegious. Perhaps man likes to remind himself of what he's lost as well as gained in the name of religious progress. The kings of Thailand traditionally take the Hindu name of Rama, just as many kings of France were called Louis, in honor of the saint, but they at least shared his Catholic faith. On the highest pedestal of all sits the really quite tiny figure of the Emerald Buddha. Actually made of jade, not emerald, it's the most sacred icon of Thai Buddhism, as near a divine image as a non-divinity can get. It's also the evergreen symbol of national unity. In Thai society, we are put it by birth when we are grow up. We learn the goodness of the, the Buddha. We can say that uh, the Buddhism and the Thai nationality are the same. 
Now, what about the question of believing in God or in God? Is that something different? In Buddhism, there are many, many gods, maybe millions of millions of gods, but not in the sense that they create the universe, they create the man and animal, they control us. But we believe God, the God in the sense that uh, they are live in, in, in the heaven. Some God also stay in, on the earth, on the mountain. We and God have the same destination. We are both, we are getting old, we are dying. Yes. So that we and God are the friend of each other. But the gods, then, gods do die then? Yes, the God it disappear. And is reborn? Reborn again. Depend and can that, he go up or down? Yeah, yeah. Up and down depend that what the karma or the action we perform during in their life. And this is true of men? Yeah. But can men become gods? Yes, of they course. Can. Yeah, they can. They but can. that's not a very important thing to yeah, be. Not, not important, yes. Uh, we don't care much about the God, what the God thinking or when we perform good and bad action have nothing to do with the God. Since Thai society has changed enormously, as we, as we see particularly in Bangkok, yes. Buddhism surely cannot make that go back to what it was before. In this state, I think maybe no way to back to the former Thai society, that agricultural society. Everybody want the big car, big house, want big money. That, yes. That's the problem. There may be no official gods in Thailand, but Mammon has plenty of temples. The Siam National Bank borrows its sense of scale from the great halls and shrines of Buddhism. Asia's religious belief in the omnipotence of economic growth has taken a knock recently, but the temple still stands. The priests and priestesses of Prophet go to lunch under the at least semi-divine eye of the king and queen of Thailand. Even here, the iconography of the Ramayana myths graces materialism with the lineaments of the spiritual. The bank's murals borrow their grandeur from the royal temple and were executed by a painter whose kudos comes from his sacred style. And cosseted among the vignettes of traditional Thai life, the bank's modern logo. Greenpeace is the painted ship upon this painted ocean, a tribute to ecology in one of the pollution capitals of the world. Would Giotto or Michelangelo do commercials if they lived today? They might draw the line at McDonald's, but the very same muralist from the bank also immortalized Ronald McDonald in a style normally reserved for dealing with something bigger even than a Big Mac, if that's not sacrilegious to imagine. The Thais are unsentimental about the past, perhaps because it is past. For Buddhists, the wheel of existence keeps turning, and the great cycle of life will, after all, bring the past back in due time. For Thais, history is in the future, so why retrieve it now? I hadn't the luxury of waiting time, so I set out from Bangkok to the old summer palace at Bang Pa Inn. The palace monastery is on an island and seemingly populated exclusively by children, albeit holy ones.
East is East and West is West. And architecturally, this is one of the places where they meet. This building is a tribute, I suppose, to Victorian suburban church architecture of the kind that John Betjeman admired. And it was constructed at the order of Rama V, the King of Siam who brought the English governess to look after his children, little knowing that he would be in a musical much later. To the outside eye, it looks exactly like uh, the sort of church which you would find in Bronsbury Park or Tooting. When you go inside, there's something of a surprise. The figure on the altar may look like a Western import, but that's Buddha, not Jesus, on a pedestal. Until King Rama V in the mid-19th century, you could say that the Thai god was not in the heavens, but in the royal palace. The king was treated as a divinity. The royal family were literally untouchable, with tragic consequences. When the boat containing Rama's queen and her children capsized in the river, no servant dared lend them a hand. It was against the law to touch a living god. The old idea of the divine monarchy drowned with the queen and one of the princesses. Perhaps the river gods had not been sufficiently assuaged. T.S. Eliot once said about the Mississippi that he didn't know much about gods, but he thought the river was a strong brown god. This is a pretty strong god too, but it's more kind of dirty gray color. I don't know whether the Buddhists revere the gods of rivers like the Greeks did. They have ample cause to, though, because this is where their, their riches partly come from. So I imagine they do. <coughs> Under the aegis of Mammon, one oriental skyline is getting to look very like another. Kuala Lumpur is only a short flight from Bangkok, but for Malays, Allah, not Buddha, presides. Allah and his more mundane Malaysian deputy, economic progress. The city shows all the recognized architectural signs of modernity, tempered with Islamic traces. The Asian obsession with novelty, decorated with Islamic motifs, unchanged for centuries. At first sight, this isn't really the image of an Islamic society that I might have expected. If you look at this picture, you can see that there's a, a huge minaret there, which looks like something on a mosque, but in fact, I suspect, is to do with telecommunications. And on the other side, you've got a, a sort of enormous hairdryer pointed at the moon, which again suggests an interest in other worlds, rather foreign to the retroactive Islamic societies of the Middle East. As far as the fundamentalist Islamic societies of the Middle East are concerned, you could well say that the past is there. The future, apparently, is here. Chinese, Indians, Thais, and of course native Malays make up the varied population of Malaysia. There are many religions and their respective gods all seem to rub along together just fine. But it's Allah who supplies the structure of the country's society. Despite the breadth of religious culture represented here, the ethnic Malays are the majority, and Malays are Muslim. Officially, at least, Allah is the boss. In other parts of the world, Islam is often the partner of stagnation. But for an avowedly Muslim country, Malaysia has done remarkably well in the modern world. Perhaps it's only pure, uncompromised Islam which leads to social paralysis. But even in Malaysia, everything still stops at prayer time. The fabric and design of the National Mosque may be airport modern, 
the religious message it enshrines can never change. The theological score is, and will ever be, Allah one, the rest nil. Pious Malays do not assemble in the spirit of inquiry, still less of doubt. Rather, they step away for a few minutes from the unknowns of westernization and retreat into the known, the tried and the tested. The law and the word of Allah. The Greeks had their oracle at Delphi, the Chinese of Kuala Lumpur can come here to find out what the future holds. These ethnic Chinese Malaysians are having a birthday party for a whiskery god. They know it's the right day because this god was once a man, a Chinese general who lived in the Third Kingdom. In honor of his intimidating wisdom and bravery, banquets are prepared, joss sticks are lit, and symbols are clashed. Unlike Thai Buddhists, these petitioners do not feel that they themselves have much control over their own fortunes. Buddhists can earn merit and derive hope from it of a better life. The Taoists, like Westerners, are more at the mercy of the gods. Am I right in thinking that in Taoism there is no great interest in God in the Christian sense or in gods? in the Hindu sense? In the Taoist philosophy, there's no one God. Mm -hmm. But in the actual practice of Taoism as a ritualistic belief system with his own rituals, they believe in one God. And that person, they consider to be Lao Tzu, who is the person who wrote the book, The Way of the Tao. And that is a historical figure. And those who believe in Taoism religion claim that it was under inspiration of God that that particular book was written. But he is not himself a god. Lao Tzu Pansan Pusikasan. He himself is not God. Right. Because God don't need inspiration. God Very is good. like God okay. A. Very good. <laughs> Are you a Taoist yourself? I am a combination of Taoism, Buddhism, Confucianism, and I'm also a product of the Christian education, someone that is living in a Muslim cultural world. So you're almost as big a mess as I am, are you? No, I can't speak on your behalf, I'm quite in a mess. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm very interested in the, in the notion of, of, um, of this temple being some kind of an oracle. Hey, oh, uh, are you gay? Uh, eh? Seriously, if you don't have to tell what you wish, you, yes. you do for a wish, then he'll tell you how to proceed with the ritual. Yes. Is that possible? Yes, yes. But then let's do it. Yeah. The first bamboo stick that dropped out that will have a number to that, and then that will represent it. It doesn't matter, he can repeat the whole thing again. Even here there are skills one That's doesn't right. have. Because the local people are so used to it. There's only one thing. left. You notice that, you know, cannot, it's not counted. It should be the one that dropped out. Doesn't matter which way out there. No, it doesn't matter. Across town, the general's birthday party continues. Taoists do not simply hope or trust in the attentions of heaven. Leaving nothing to chance, their drums are designed to wake the gods. After all, if you're going to burn a palace and a stable full of horses, you do want the divinity's full attention. Fire, so often the vehicle of worship, the conduit between man and god. But in a tropical climate like Malaysia's, Rain is often more prevalent than flames. There's a large Chinese Buddhist constituency in Malaysia, but their version has different livery to the Thai. Even the Lord Buddha himself looks unfamiliar. More Chinese, really.
there are distinct ancillary Chinese gods as well, whose wrath is more explicit. They have a more vindictive air than the smiling Lord Buddha ever did. About 10% of Malaysians are ethnic Indians, transplanted from southern India as cheap labor by the British colonial authorities. They simply brought their gods with them and still honor them in a cave just outside Kuala Lumpur. In any number of myths, the earth is said to be the house of God. It's not just churches and temples that are said to be that, but in fact, the whole of the earth. And uh, when you visit caves like this, you can well see where that kind of myth came from. If gods don't inhabit caverns, they inhabit mountaintops. It would be convenient and Freudian to suppose that gods were on the mountains and that goddesses were in caverns. It's not quite true. Even though, in fact, oracles and priestesses who give the word of God tend to loiter in dark places. This is pretty well lit, and as uh, one of the rooms in God's houses goes, it's, uh, it's pretty impressive. And it has this uh, magnificent chimney, which leads straight up to the heavens. While what appears to be the goddess of Swiss army knives looks on, the curious can explore a kind of Madame Tussauds of the divine. We have uh, Lord Brahma, who is the creator, and uh, we have Lord Vishnu, who is the preserver, and uh, then we have Lord Shiva, who is the destroyer. And uh, these are the three gods that uh, form the main trinity. Then, of course, on the other side, we have uh, Mahavishnu and uh, Lakshmi, the goddess of wealth. And these gods are, are immortal, they have lived forever and uh, will live forever? Yes, the goddess, they have no end and no beginning and no end. But they also have children, don't they? They have descendants. The, the idea of these uh, children and the family and all is to make the lay, laymen or the common people to understand and appreciate the concept of God. And this is the Rama Saga, in effect, that That's enables right. them to relate Correct, yes. divinities to ordinary life. That's right, yes. And are there local gods in, in southern India which you would not find in northern or in Malaysia that you would not find in either of those places? The same gods will take different names mm -hmm. and they come in different forms. So the, the duplication of names is there. You can't, I mean, there's uh, many, many places. Yeah, so this is, this is echoed in Greek mythology where you have local Dionysus or local Aphrodite. Correct, yes, who are slightly yes. different. If you make a comparison, there's so much of parallel between Greek mythology and Hindu mythology. Yes. There's no running away from it. <laughs> Do Hindus sometimes have their own choice of God, or does God sometimes choose a Hindu in some way? What, what, how, do you, how do you read that? No, no, the, the people have the choice of their gods. The gods don't choose them. <laughs> the gods don't choose them, They're so not to speak. interested in that? <laughs> no, I wouldn't say that, but the fact that a God, you know, is able to make a, a person come to him means that God has given him the blessing mm -hmm. to be his devotee, you see? Hinduism, and I notice, is a highly democratic religion. Yes. They don't uh, try to convert, they don't try to say, you must be here, nothing. You know, this is left to the individual to think for himself. Not all gods are so permissive. Striking out into the jungles of Malaysia, one expects the exotic and sometimes finds the familiar. The indigenous people of the Malaysian Peninsula are known as the Orang Asli, the original people. But the original beliefs of many indigenous tribes have been left behind. 
the Methodists converted this particular village, and now they line up to rehearse the Christian creed and fight the good fight. Today is a christening, an initiation into a foreign way of life and belief, a baptism a world away from the waters of the River Jordan. More imo singing today. More in. Okay. And Baptist Samoran, he kukatuh muh menu, ruklok sante. As another child moves closer to Jesus, the villagers move further away from their cultural and religious heritage. Introduction to a new God can spell divorce from the old. <laughs> Better the devil you know, goes the saying. But what about the God? How long have you been a Christian yourself? Since 1962. And what were you before that? Animists believe in different spirits. Powerful spirit and less powerful spirit. And uh, Are these of ancestors? Some from ancestors, some from the spirit give dreams before becoming Christian, our whole life controlled by the fear and we always guided by the dreams. Right. So are they now not afraid? No, no. Formerly, yes, very afraid. Perhaps the villagers are happier now they've found someone to pray to. But they didn't fall into the arms of Jesus. They were pushed. Well, I suppose about 200 years ago, uh, this area had many gods, yeah. um, and they seemed really to function quite well until then. Why did they need the Christian God? I think those of us who are Christians, first of all, have experienced God's wonderful love. And not all religions have a message of love, of forgiveness, and grace, and mercy. Christianity has brought to this part of the world a sense of sin. Um, are you altogether happy about um, telling people uh, that certain things which they've always done perfectly happily have become sin? Most of the things that Christians brought were already acknowledged as sins, like greed, pride, murder, adultery. I think the, the difference is that the God and Father of our Lord Jesus sent him to bring a message of forgiveness, a message of grace, and that there is nothing that we can do to earn our salvation or God's forgiveness. It's a free gift through the sacrificial death of Jesus on the cross. There is hope for everyone that if they will repent and trust, then there is forgiveness. A new relationship with God. And if not, not? If you do not respond, then you will perish. Well, that's a pretty tough uh, alternative, isn't it? Um, um, it, is, it is if you don't see that the offer, first of all, was a free gift. Now, out here, there are many gods, and they may uh, war with each other. They may even try to kill each other. They may live and they may also die, unlike yeah. uh, the monotheistic gods. Um, but they do seem to live and let live uh, to a great extent. Do you think that Christianity has to cohabit with other religions and accept their insights? When I look at other religions, I, I respect their sincerity and I respect their integrity. But because I have come to know Jesus as a living person and a saviour, and what I read in the Bible uh, becomes a reality in my life, then I have to say that what Jesus claimed is true, that he is the way to the Father. And if you come to trust in him, you come to know God as he is. And that sets Christianity apart from all other religions. <laughs> Christian soldiers would find few recruits in Kelantan, the most Muslim state in Malaysia. In the state capital of Kota Baru, 
Islam is far too robust and self-assured for its followers to hear the call of Jesus Christ. There is no market for Jehovah here. But Islam too was once an import. It was carried here by Arab traders and exchanged for spices, timber and silks. The locals were impressed that the Muslim Arab traders always kept their word. So the Malay sultans bought their gods as well as their goods. Once the local sultans were converted, the people followed. And while Malays are natural traders, they seem unlikely ever to swap their adherence to Islam. We got Muslim go to pray. Close 30 minutes. Business close 30 minutes. Together. Suddenly we seem to be in a state of uh, flight from all commerce, and everyone is on their way to prayer. So I guess I better get out of here because they're going to shut the cafe, believe it or not. After the Almighty has been fed with his nightly tributes, his followers are free to eat again and again. Although the small coastal villages of Kelantan also belong just as firmly to Allah, there are still faint traces of the gods and spirits whom he replaced. Many of the villages have a bomo, a kind of Malaysian medicine man. Banyak kerja bahasa kena luar pada penyakit apa ni penyakit tuhan bui lah kita kata kan tak? Jadi penyakit makhluk bui sebaliknya bila balik bila makhluk diancamkan buat kerenak kepada manusia itu maka kena lah orang tu. Jadi pak ni tu hot sekali pak ni boleh pisah lah. Memeh pak ni sebenarnya itu mikut dah satu hari juga. Pak ni bergantung kepada tuhan. Hmm. Sebab Puan Nik duduk bayan, bila Puan Nik di berkat, kita kata tak, seorang Puan Mu ni berkat, rahmat, Tuhan beri ya. Jadi kita suku Alhamdulillah lah, pemberian Tuhan kepada yang Puan Mu kita ni. Hmm. Semantiasa pun betul-betul Puan Nik menghadapi kepada Tuhan, dia percaya kepada Tuhan. Walaupun Puan Nik berasa lebih, Puan Nik, Nik sekal khabar lah. Hmm. Kalau Puan Nik berasa lebih pun inilah ada pemberian Tuhan. Like an exotic curate, and speaking in the local dialect, the Bomo's assistant begins the evening's proceedings. Before any treatment or consorting with spirits can begin, a gesture of obeisance to the Almighty Allah. is an old man suffering from undiagnosed ills. The cure supposedly lies in the hands of these men. As the ritual quickens, the thick applique of imported monotheism begins to curl at the edges, giving an inkling of a more ancient religious culture. If the patient is to be cured, man must intervene where Allah cannot or will not. The Prophet Muhammad would accept that these villagers are Muslims like any other, then Islam is a much broader church than we've ever been led to believe.
Well, you've looked very interested and quizzical, but you haven't told us what you really think about the gods and religions of Southeast Asia, have you? Well, I think it's a good idea to um, be interested and learn something before one starts passing opinions. Even now, I think they're a great deal more interesting than I had imagined before, but I'm not about to judge them. Can you really see yourself believing in or embracing any of the religions or faiths you've come across? Well, I think the problem there is that these are not faiths chosen individually from some kind of spiritual boutique. They nearly all of them belong to communities, and since I don't belong to those communities, um, I can't seriously imagine myself suddenly seeking to acquire those beliefs. Two weeks in the Far East is only enough time to get a flavor of the range of gods and non-gods on offer. I suppose all my thinking is colored in a sense by a residual and pretty firm belief that it is unwise to think that God is going to intervene if one prays to him or if one believes in him. The events of the world are not of a kind which makes one think that going to fortune tellers or appealing to specific images is going to change the fate of man. And one's vision of this place is that of a curious tourist who doesn't want to fall into the old trap of thinking that people who are inscrutable are wise. I'm reminded of an old story of the man who went to visit a guru in the mountains of Nepal and spent 14 years preparing himself for the great meeting with a man who was going to tell him what the meaning of life was. And when eventually after this arduous initiation, the man was finally admitted to the master, he said to the master, master, tell me, what is the meaning of life? And the master said, life is a fountain. And the pupil said, life is a fountain? And the master said, life isn't a fountain? <laughs> 